Good afternoon. Welcome to Bio. Oh my God, it's not Bio 304, it's Bio 340, Conservation Biology. This chapter is on urbanization. I'm Dr. Jess Stratford from Wilkes University. First, let's define urbanization. Uh, it's the conversion of natural uh, land cover, like a forest, field, desert, swamp, to uh, land cover that's dominated by human created um, structures or just land cover. For example, a lawn is part of urbanization. But most time we consider uh, urbanized areas to be those covered in buildings, streets, and parking lots. And um, usually, and most often, it's easiest to measure the amount of impervious surface if you're talking about like what is urban. As of the early 2000s, most humans on this planet now live in urban areas. Okay, before that, um, most people lived in uh, not outside of cities in agricultural areas and what's happening is that people are moving out of agriculture areas into cities. That's just the proportion of people. By 2050, uh, so we just passed more than half. By 2050, two thirds of humans will be living in, in urban areas. And this trend is most common in the Americas. Uh, this is Quito, uh, the shot. And, um, so the, the growth will mostly be in developing countries and um, some of the older uh, places where people have uh, been settled for the longest time, uh, those places are already mostly urban. So your European population is actually already 70% urban. Okay. So what I'm doing right now is just giving you an idea of um, how much of the planet is impacted by urbanization. And just to give you an idea of the extent of, of um, how much of the planet is urban and how much is going to be urbanized. We can look at mega cities. And uh, Tokyo is the largest city in the world. It's got 37 million people living in one city. Uh, followed by uh, Delhi in India, Shanghai, and Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, just to give you an idea of the size of Tokyo, um, if you see it there on the uh, right-hand side of the screen, the gray area is the areas that are deforested and, and largely just urban. If you compare that to... Uh, the entire size of South Korea and to the relative size of Japan, Tokyo is just huge. So why am I doing this chapter in conservation biology? It's a very dramatic uh, land use change. And what I mean by that is, if you look at all the land use changes out there, so if you cut down a forest and turn into a cornfield, um, that's not as different as taking a forest and converting it into um, an urban structure. And, and what I mean by that is the changes in the way energy flows and the species that are there. Um, so are going from a, a cornfield to urban is more dramatic than a forest to urban, a forest to a uh, farmland. It's a rapidly growing form of land use. So as I pointed out before, by 2050, two thirds of humans are going to be living in cities. And for cities to accommodate that, the movement into cities um, as the population grows. So you have the population growing and then moving into cities, you're gonna have to have cities just grow. Uh, it's a relatively permanent form of land use change. So um, if we go from forest to a cornfield, 
and we change our minds and say, boy, wasn't it nice when a forest was here? Uh, we could simply walk away and that cornfield might turn into a forest in about 50 years. If you abandon a city, it might be hundreds of years, thousands of years before nature can take over a, um, a, an urban area. So once you convert something into an urban area, a parking lot, say, it's going to stay a parking lot for a very long time. So my message with that is um, if you're planning a city and you have conservation in mind, you better do it right the first time because you won't be able to alter your city, right? If you are um, have a forestry plan and you're cutting trees, say, every 25 or 50 years and you don't like it, you can simply alter that plan, but you can't go back on, on uh, once you urbanize an area. If you look at cities, um, I brought this up with forest fragmentation. I'll bring it up again because I think it's an important point. If you look at cities in the urban rural gradient, typically for any city, uh, what you have is a very dense urban area, what we call high intensity urban. So it's mostly impervious surfaces. Low intensity urban means you're throwing in some pervious surface. So like uh, a lawn, for example, um, and some green space. And then uh, outside of that, you have suburban areas. So you can see the change in color as you go from the center in your bottom right hand uh, outward, especially to the left, how green it's getting. And you can see the suburbs in there quite clearly. You can see the streets uh, forming regular patterns, but you can see how green it's getting. And then at the very end, uh, and you can see this for, at the top center, uh, you have this urban wildlands interface, okay? So that's, that's a very typical pattern uh, we see in cities today. So let's look at the changes associated with urbanization. Just like forest fragments, it's hotter and drier, okay? With hotter, um, it's hotter for one reason is uh, there's a lack of shade. There's no trees or fewer trees. So there's less shade. So you have the sun hitting things like pavement. Uh, there's a lack of transpiration. So trees uh, keep it cooler, not only from their shade. So trees are through evapotranspiration. You have water being converted from um, a liquid to a gas. So that conversion absorbs heat, which cools down the atmosphere. So without a lack of trees, with a lack of trees, it becomes hotter, right? Albedo is when a surface um, is struck by light, uh, what happens to it? Is it reflected or is it absorbed? And cities absorb heat. And it does so because, you know, dark surfaces will absorb heat as compared to a, a light source. And so you get something called the heat island effect. And the heat island effect is when it comes to urbanization is cities act as islands where they're hotter than the surrounding area. And we know that through some experiments, some interesting experiments, uh, that this affects things uh, like tree growth. You have actually have a longer growing season in urban areas. So it's, it's pretty intense. And uh, to offset this, um, some buildings have painted their roofs white to increase the albedo, so the reflectance of heat instead of the absorbance. It's drier, so the soils are much drier in urban areas, and you have impervious surfaces, so this alters water flow, and uh, that'll make it less available for plants. Other are abiotic changes. You have light pollution, which are showing is very important for birds. Um, some coastal areas that are urban will actually affect sea turtles, um, but light pollution is a large one. Noise pollution affects things like birds. Urban streams have two things, increased flash, which is how quickly they rise up and down, and increased scouring. So with that rapid increase, in um, water volume and energy, you have increased scouring. 
which is the the cutting of of rivers so what happens in watersheds with low impervious surface is that the watershed itself is absorbing the forests and and plants around it are absorbing that water and it moves much more slowly to things like streams and rivers where if you put impervious surface everything is is dumped very quickly into these streams and so they rise very quickly and what you'll find um, is that many urban streams you see this in los angeles and this is a image from uh, columbus georgia because scouring is so bad that the streams overflow and uh, shift very quickly and what they do is they end up paving the uh, the streams with urbanization there's a large number of biotic changes so there is there's a lack of tree cover right so the forest is removed or whatever native habitats are moved and replaced with with buildings and parking lots and streets so this will affect it's just a lack of habitat will affect most organisms so most birds most mammals and most insects have lower diversity okay lower diversity in urban places and so you get a feedback system where uh, the lack of tree cover um, leads to abiotic changes hotter drier and lack of water will affect uh will have a biotic effect as well so there's a loss of like uh, understory plants so if you go to the forest in pennsylvania and you walk through you'll see lots of understory plants that you will not see in urban areas even places that um, little corners of areas that are untouched you won't see say wild ginger or orchids popping up you'll you'll get what are essentially uh, weedy species. All right. Um, so overall, we can say there's a lower species richness of vertebrates, of understory plants. For the trees that are there, it's often just a subset of trees. Um, for invertebrates, it's very mixed, where the overall the species richness is down. Uh, some areas actually have a hump shape. So urban areas for most taxa have very low species richness. And then the question is, that's urban areas. So what about suburban areas or things with mixed use? Is sometimes you'll find a hump shape. And what I mean by that is the forests have relatively low, urban's the lowest, and then you'll find the highest diversity of sites that have intermediate use. So a forested suburban site may have uh, more birds, more insects, et cetera. And so what you're doing is instead of just one habitat forest, when you're at the forest edge, you can get forest species and then you can get species that are um, tolerant of hu humans, excuse me. There are a number of species that are tolerant of humans and we're going to call those synanthropic species. So syn means together, anthro means man. So synanthropic means um, living together with humans. So to give it a formal definition, synanthropic species have a higher fitness when they're around people. Okay, these can include uh, mesopredator mammals and some birds. So um, these pictures were from, um, the cat is from Chaco's, which is a bowling place on Wilkes-Barre uh, Boulevard. Okay, so it's so completely surrounded by uh, urban, urban areas and we get lots of cats running through there. Uh, this other site is located just outside of Wilkes-Barre up 309 towards Mountaintop. And uh, we get we get lots of foxes at these sites, so they're they're coming into urban areas, and uh, they're meso predators, so they're uh, predating things like uh, mice, small birds. Um, the meso predator birds would include things like jays and crows. 
So crows definitely have a higher fitness around people. Uh, other than mesopredators, there's some granivorous vertebrates that do well. So that include mice um, and some sparrows and pigeons. Invasive species tend to do better um, when they're associated with humans. And then organisms that live in or on houses, okay? So some of these animals are skunks, rats, raccoons, squirrels, house sparrows, pigeons, starlings. And then within the house, we have things like cockroaches, silverfish, house mouse, house sparrows, house finches, um, of course, cats and dogs. Uh, and then the other interesting thing is that some pollinators actually do better um, in moderately urbanized areas. And this is probably because in the forest, there's few plants there that are flowering. And when you have moderate disturbance, so when you have, say, um, an area, uh, when I think of Wilkes-Barre, I think of the edge of Wilkes-Barre, where you have um, the shopping areas. And what you have is a ring around those shopping areas where weeds are allowed to grow and weeds are great for pollinators. So in some invertebrate taxa, it's the pollinators that do a little bit better, but many, many invertebrates actually uh, have their lowest species richness uh, in urban areas. So if you think about, instead of having uh, so this woods to the left, if you think about insects that might break down leaf litter and you have no leaf litter, those insects are going to disappear. Okay. There's something called biotic homogenization. And to be homogenized means you're the same throughout. And so this is where you have the same species uh, spatially. And what you find is that uh, Santhropic species are the ones you find all over the place. And so uh, regardless of where you go, you're very likely to find pigeons, cockroaches, house sparrows, rats. And when I say mice, I mean a house mouse. And uh, there's been some studies come out on mice and looking at mice and their genetics reflects the colonization of Europeans around the, the planet. So we have a uh, a record and we can actually test some hypotheses about human settlement by looking at mice genetics, which is pretty cool. But um, I remember going to South America for the first time, stepping off the plane and just being very excited about what birds I was gonna see. And of course the first bird you see is uh, house sparrows. So I saw those in South America and those are native to Europe. So kind of kind of a downer. Okay, so ecosystem services are altered in urban areas. And I will say that what's kind of cool is this is, uh, we're just starting to look at um, how urbanization affects ecosystem services. So the way that a lot of um, conservation biology has progressed is you want to know how a certain activity impacts things like diversity. That's an easy, low-hanging fruit thing to measure. And then the next step you do is how changes in species richness and diversity, how those things affect what they do, okay? So we're just getting into ecosystem services and how they're impacted in urban areas. So insectivory, uh, I have a manuscript I'm about to submit that shows that um, insectivory is lowest in urban areas. It's actually highest in suburban areas and low again in forests, but urban areas have the lowest uh, rates of insect insectivory. And the way we measured this was using model clay caterpillar. So you roll out some clay, make it look like a caterpillar, glue it on a branch, you go back a week later and you look at, you set out a whole bunch of them a week later, you see how many have been bitten. So the birds leave beak marks. So it's a good way to get an index of insectivory rates and that's not surprising. It's because what you find is that ins insectivorous birds are hit hardest by
by uh, urbanization. So long distance migrants that tend to eat insects are the ones you don't find in urban areas. Who do you find in urban areas? Things like the granivorous species, so pigeons eat seeds, house sparrows eat seeds, or you find generalists, things like the invasive starling, okay? But insectivores tend to be lost, and that's true for mammals as well. Uh, frugivory, so that is the eating of fruits. So this is something we have not looked at yet. This is a wide open field. So in other words, if you're a raspberry bush living on the the edge of a city or in a city or in the forest, how does the changes in abundance in these species affect fruit removal rates and uh, how well your seeds are able to get around? This we don't know. Nutrient cycling, we know a little bit better. And what we do know is that um, because people are fertilizing their lawns is that nitrogen tends to be jacked up. Phosphorus tends to be jacked up. And um, we still don't know well uh, what are the consequences of those things. So what would be cool is if we can get some dead wood, dead leaves, and just look at the breakdown of organic products and how things are recycled. I think we have a lot to learn about nutrient cycling in urban areas. The wildlands urban interface this is where, if you remember the way cities are set up, it's high intensity urban, low intensity urban in suburban areas. And then you get to the forests and agriculture areas. The wildlands urban interface is where the suburb meets the forest. And there's some really interesting things that happen there. Um, this is where zoonotic diseases have the highest prevalence, things like Lyme disease and West Nile. Uh, Lyme disease, because what you have is the the um, the vector is the tick, right? And the primary host is the white-footed mice, mouse. And you find tons of of mice at the at the wildlands urban interface. So uh, this would be agricultural areas, fields, um, just edges of suburbs. And you have those things in the forest, but the difference is you have um, a high abundance of the mice, the ticks, and then you also have the people. So urban areas, you have the people, but you don't have the mice. Forests, you have the mice, but not necessarily the people. So where these two things meet are things like parks that are right on the edge and uh, if you look at Wilkesbury and look at where the, the ball fields are, except for Kirby Park, uh, you have a ring of parks all around Wilkesbury. And these will probably be where you have a high incidence of Lyme disease transmission. West Nile is high because of the same reason. You have a higher diversity and higher abundance of um, mosquitoes in the suburbs. So suburbs have uh, breed lots of breeding sites. That's what it comes down to. It's lots of breeding sites for mosquitoes. So you actually have a, a higher uh, species richness of mosquitoes in, in uh, suburban areas because you have trees. There's a bunch of uh, tree hole nesting mosquitoes. You have mosquitoes that live in the uh, septic system, right? The drainage system on roads. You have all the uh, gutters, and if your gutter doesn't drain completely, those are great breeding sites for um, West, West Nile carrying mosquitoes. And then you throw the people in. So uh, West Nile is highest in, in suburban areas. Uh, the wildlands urban interface is where wildfires are the worst. And by the worst, I mean they have the highest impact on people, negative impact on people. And um, throwing climate change and you get things like the California wildfires that have killed many people and the property damage is just astronomic. So that's where, so if a fire burns where people don't live, that's no big deal. And you don't get forest fires in urban areas. It's, it's where people have spread into the forest. So where you have 
say a few roads into the forest or suburb surrounded by forest, that's where your forest fire is going to be the worst. The wildlands urban interface is also where you have the largest number of human wildlife conflicts. And um, so this would include bear, large cats, et cetera. I threw in a deer here because if you look at deer collisions, they tend to be very high in suburban areas. So deer will often find habitat, uh, food and safety in suburban areas where you have a mix of forest and people living and uh, so you get a large number of deer, uh, yeah, deer car collisions, but it's also where bears will come in and raid people's garbage and, and have other conflicts. And out west, you have large cat conflicts. So if you look at an urban woodlot, okay, you find lots of invasives. They're, they're empty of, say, long distance migrants, okay? So you say like, what is the point of an urban woodlot, right? If you're gonna save uh, land, green land, you should do so where you're gonna save a whole bunch of species. I'd argue that the, the value of an urban woodlot is that this might be the only interaction with nature that urban residents have. And that connection um, is really important for the the human condition, and then how people perceive nature. So urban woodlots are good for people. We know that the more green space, the more trees, the lower the crime rates, okay? And you also have things where these urban woodlots may serve as stepping stones for some species. We know that although migratory birds don't nest in urban woodlots at high rates, these may be very important as stopover sites. So they, they're actually very buggy uh, in the fall and filled with things like raspberries and uh, invasive plants that have fruit. So there you have it. All right, so that's your lecture on urbanization. If you have any questions, please email me.